turn it into try instead of hex. On these three pathways, the green pathway, the purple pathway, and the little yellow pathway, mm -hmm. you don't have magic through, you know, x-ray vision to see underground how the, the rocks are all the way to Santa Fe or San Ildefonso, but is there potential for there to be iron along those pathways? A absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and I do have those 3D eyes. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> it actually comes from core examples, bringing them up to the surface. But um, um, understanding where um, the, the abundances of iron, there's no organic matter once you get below the surface in here, or so little that it's, it's irrelevant. So it's really about iron for the most part at this point. And um, I didn't plan to get into it today, but we actually have, um, we, we did some pretty innovative analysis here looking at uh, chrome isotopes. So you probably understand a little bit about isotopes. Every compound like chromium doesn't just exist as one valence it's, uh, or, or one um, uh, isotopic abundance. In chromium, there's chrome 53 and chrome 52. And depending on how much iron or organic matter it encounters along the way, you start seeing the, the shift in the amount of chrome 53 to chrome 52. And we do a lot of that work to actually understand um, how much, um, I'll call it water-rock interaction is taking place with rock that has iron in it. Because we start seeing the, uh, the ratio of 50, chrome 53 to chrome 52 changing. And we're actually seeing that it's pretty outrageously large amounts of it in these basalts that are in the Vedos zone here. One of our next really uh, important points of interest is how much of that iron and how effective is that iron once the chromium gets into the regional aquifer. Um, okay, is everyone with me so far on all this? Okay, let's move on. Can I have another question? Sure. Since the chromium uh, was being used as an anti-corrosion agent, we can assume it had some value. And how much did it cost? Like these. 58,000 kilograms of chromium? I, I, uh, absolutely. How valuable was that, that people were just venting out into the environment? I don't think it was valued like that. I mean, I think that's noise in the scale of laboratory operations. But I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of walk you through a little cartoon now of a few slides, basically rebuilding that same case I just made for the crazy straw. So here's that crazy complex geology again. Um, next slide. Um, here's the cooling towers represented by these symbols right up here. Um, and we're going to start following that down to the water table just to kind of reiterate again the, the story I told you in maybe a little bit more long-winded way. Next slide. So basically here's the surface water flow coming out of um, that outfall and the cooling tower, the solid line in here represents places, links along the canyon where the water was persistent. There was enough effluent that it actually created essentially a stream that carried down all the way to a location about where here where it starts showing as a dashed line. And this basically would, water would only project down into this area maybe during a flood or during a day where a particularly large um, effluent release occurred. Next slide. Okay, so basically, um, actually back up just a touch, one more please. Um, one thing I wanted to point out in here is that this little yellow area right in here is one of these examples of um, sediment that sits in the bottom of these canyons. You heard some discussion, I think, from Dave Cobrain about something called the alluvial groundwater. That's basically just these shallow 20 or 30 foot thick sand deposits essentially in the bottom of the canyons that sometimes contain water, in, in this case, really where there's effluent to support it. So this surface water flows, mostly the surface expression and the first place in this whole length of canyon for about four miles in here that you even encounter enough of this alluvium to actually start accumulating water is all the way down in this area. It just so happens it's the same area where I described that we're starting to see evidence of surface loss to the subsurface, kind of the beginning of the crazy straw journey. Um, this little shaded area right in here within that yellow is just sim symbolizing that the surface flow infiltrates and kind of fills up the bottom of this little sand bed down on the bottom of the canyon. Okay, please. And we have evidence that um, it starts to move downward, basically, at that point. And these arrows are just conceptual arrows pointing in a lot of different directions simply because we're trying to um, illustrate here that this is complicated. It's not just a vertical pipe. There's all kinds of layering in the subsurface that causes these waters to stop, 
maybe move laterally a little bit, move vertically again, and that's simply what's depicted here. We have wells down in this area right here that have never wetted up. So a combination of that surface water balance um, illustration that I showed you and dry wells down here tell us that this water is all moving vertically, basically right in this area in here. The effluent volume today is around 300,000 gallons per day. And yet it doesn't fill up this little system in here and it doesn't wet up wells that sit right here. So what does that tell us? It tells us that that same amount must be moving vertically every day as well because it doesn't fill up this very small pile of sand in here. It just, like a yo-yo, it goes up and down as the effluent volume changes every day. Next slide. <clears throat> um, one more. So what it does here, illustrated by these little blue shaded areas, is it finds contrasts in the rock properties on the way down. And it starts perching the water. So you hear the term perched intermediate water. That's basically what you're looking at here. Um, you can imagine that this water infiltrating through the tub that forms the cliffs that you see around the laboratory suddenly sees basalt. I think we all know what basalt is. This basalt is a big, black, massive rock with fractures in it. <clears throat> it sees that and it perches on top of it and it starts moving through that crazy straw, that southward dip that I showed you in that one illustration, as well as all the unbelievably complex layering within the 300 feet of basalt. And it also finds additional perching horizons down within this wedge of basalt before, next slide, it finally breaks through that, again, probably through a series of fractures, finally breaks through that and enters the water table, next slide, and basically forms the plume. Groundwater direction is from left to right in here, and this multicolored depiction in here is basically the plume playing out once this contamination reaches the water. Okay, next slide. And here we are again, basically, to the beginning of the story. I promised I'd bring you back around. Here's the plumes. Uh, perchlorate plume right in here. Uh, chromium plume right here. Sandia Canyon, just to reorient you, um, the original infiltration window, the beginning of the crazy straw in Sandia Canyon is about right in here, in this area. Hits those basalts, moves south. And these shaded areas here are our current best estimation of the, sort of the fingers, if you will, that finally drop into the regional groundwater through this crazy complex you know, straw that things move laterally on perching horizons and finally break through at a couple of three key locations and then the groundwater gradient west to east in here forming these plumes as we see them now. And this is basically, in a nutshell, the conclusions of the report that we're presenting to NMED in a couple of days um, is basically this is our current story of where the contamination is, and all the information I've just presented here is basically the, the building blocks of the story on how it got to be where it is. It's really important in these kinds of investigations, not only to be able to describe where it is today, but being able to describe and understand how it got there becomes the very foundation for how you might approach remedying the problem. Um, I heard some discussion earlier about why isn't more of this work already done already. There's no way in the world that you could go in and try to, to do a, um, a cost-effective or smart remediation project on a chromium plume and groundwater without understanding every bit of that information that I just presented to you. So it's not just about putting a well in, seeing contamination, and feeling like you got to get on it right away. It's really about building an investigation that really informs smart use of resources to tackle the problem. These are really complex problems. Um, this is no doubt one of the most complex um, plumes within the Dealey complex in terms of how, to, how um, it got to where it is um, and what we might do to tackle it. Next slide. So basically, path forward, as I've said a couple of times, the investigation report, phase two investigation report, um, formally goes to NMD on uh, Sunday, which of course that's not going to happen, so we're delivering it on Friday. Uh, we anticipate a review from NMED. Typically, these are 30 to 60 day review cycles. Um, a wetland stabilization project, David Cobrain talked about that. We all recognize that, that wetland at the head of the, uh, of the Sandia watershed um, is paramount for basically keeping stable and managing that inventory in there. But just as important as managing the chromium inventory and keeping it stable is the fact that that wetland also contains PCBs. There were a number of operations in the upper watershed there above that wetland 
um, that there was a transformer storage area, so rainfall that would run across that storage area would rinse the PCBs off. PCBs want to stick to sediment as well. They're not mobile in the environment. That wetland is a big depositional area, so there's a, a PCB contamination in that wetland. Keeping that wetland stable um, is just as important for the PCBs as it is for, um, for chromium. Um, we anticipate, or certainly hope, that one of our next key steps forward is uh, what regulatorily we call the corrective measures evaluation. I think you guys all know about the CMB process. And basically it's the document, it's the process that where you really delve down and you look at all this information I presented, you maybe even collect a little bit of additional information if necessary to bring uh, a set of alternatives for how to tackle a problem. Um, we present that to the New Mexico Environment Department. They actually rule on a remedy and at that point we work together to basically go out and, and implement that remedy. So there's no date set for that that'll come from uh, the state's uh, review of the phase two report. The weapon stabilization project is currently planned for 13. Um, and then we are also currently evaluating the possibility of, of sort of bridging where, we're our, where we are today to the CME uh, through uh, what under the consent order is called an interim measure, which if there's something that just makes sense to go out and do that might mitigate um, some kind of a condition that you feel needs uh, a more immediate mitigation that might play out through the CME process, um, there's a process under the consent order that lets us uh, do that. Um, there's nothing uh, definitive right now about that or no specific action plan. It's just a possible um, placeholder, if you will, if, if an appropriate um, interim measure that we think uh, has an immediate impact on the plume um, could take place. Um, the weapon stabilization really in a lot of ways is a perfect interim measure. What it's going to do, and you heard again uh, Dave Colbert talk about it, it's going to allow um, a vast reduction in the effluent volume from that plant. I described the 300,000 gallons per day are currently coming out of that. Um, we think we'll be able to sort of turn the volume down on that, if you will, to around 40 to 50,000 gallons per day. So the driver through that crazy straw should be greatly reduced once we change the effluent volume because remember, what comes out seems to be going down that zone. So you turn the volume down on the effluent, the, the rate of water movement through that zone should change, and we think it could have a, a favorable impact on the chromium pollutant. And that's all I have. Thank you, Denny. I had a few questions, but I'm going to hold those uh, for offline if I want to get a chance to talk to you. Sure. In an effort to save some time. Well, I should tell you, I won't be able to stay uh, for very long, so I'm not okay. going to be able to stay for dinner. So we can either do it another time or I can get your number quickly. Or, or I can get your I'll number and call you. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Then I'm glad you came back to the PCB situation. Is that area clearly delineated and defined? It is, yeah. Is it going to be cleaned up? Um, right now, there's no plans to clean it up. The plan is to stabilize it in place. If, I, if that were on my land, I would have to clean it up to less than two parts per billion. I believe that's the minimum. Uh, and it's not, it, it may be stable, but that doesn't mean it's harmless to, well, we've, to biota, to bottle. We, we actually, that's, that's a good point. Um, the two parts per billion cleanup is a TOSCA cleanup level, as I understand, and this, these PCBs are not being managed under TOSCA. So the cleanup level is actually driven by um, the ecological and human health risk assessments. And so we did um, a very extensive uh, biota program in the wetland, small mammals, birds, bluebirds, bluebird eggs, etc., and have actually found no adverse effects on the ecosystem associated with this. We do see body burdens of PCBs, not surprisingly, um, but we don't see um, an adverse effect right now that um, has led us to recommend the cleanup of the PCBs in the wetland. The stabilization of it um, is going to go a long way towards um, disabling stormwater from picking it up and transporting it out of that wetland. We think it's actually in a fairly stable configuration. Did, did you look at aquatic species? We did. For reproductive effects? We did. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And, and actually, all of that um, is exhaustively discussed in both the phase one and phase two reports. Better than I can talk to you about it now. Okay, Danny? Is that the cleanup process, is that an expensive thing? Is that the, one of the things that's driving uh, just leaving it the way it is? 
Well, the, the wetland itself, I'm going I'm to have to think about this for a minute. The wetland itself has somewhere on the order of 80,000 cubic yards of, of contaminated sediment. And so it would be um, both expensive, although that's not what's driving the decision. I mean, the decisions are based on um, acceptability of a condition or not. If there's an unacceptable condition, then money's not at play at all in these kinds of decisions. Um, it's just the fact that right now that there's not a driver to do it. doesn't mean that uh, the New Mexico Environment Department might not feel otherwise about it through their review, but right now there's no plans to bring it up, and it's not a decision based on money. Go ahead, Bob. Yes, uh, if I were uh, in the New Mexico Environmental Department, I would <coughs> ask you the question, are there any mixtures between perchlorate and uh, chromate that you run into in that whole stream or, or area? The other question I would ask is uh, what I already asked before, and that is if you don't know the EH, you're, you're guessing as to what the oxidation reduction potential is uh, for any particular reaction that you've got going here. And uh, so uh, uh, EH is a, it costs a little more to, to do that than most of the uh, analysis, but that's what this is all about is, is oxidation reduction potential. And you need to know uh, exactly what's causing that, and that will, that is what will tell you. Right. So um, if the answer to your first question is if um, if you were in the environment department, or even if you weren't, I'll answer that um, <laughs> we do have we do have a, a mixed pollutant. Several uh, several of these wells have both perchlorate and chromium in them. They don't seem to be reacting with each other in any way. We're talking part per billion concentrations here, a few part per billion. We're not talking you know, bottles of perchlorate, we're talking about trace amounts in the groundwater. It's very important to distinguish between measurable and necessarily problematic or reactive in some way. Yeah, it's measurable because of advanced analytical methodologies. But there are concentrations in certain places. Oh, we have concentrations that are yeah. measurable. And, Absolutely. And, and those areas of concentration, the perchlorate is an oxidant, right. uh, especially... Uh, Again, we're talking concentrations of four parts per billion not very strong oxygen in four parts per billion, but you're absolutely it's right. It's a very strong oxygen versus uh, chromate. You're right. Uh, That's right. And, and one of the questions we've actually asked ourselves, we don't think we see evidence of it, but one of the questions we've asked of ourselves is, is some of the chromium we're seeing here in some of the more um, fringe areas of the plume actually not contaminant chromium at all? the chromium that came from oxidation from the perchlorate of naturally occurring chromium. So your question is dead on. One of the things we always have to do here is not play the game of guilty until proven innocent, but actually look at it and ask that very question. There's naturally occurring chromium in the rocks that comprise the aquifer. And at high enough perchlorate concentrations, you very well could oxidize and mobilize chromium, naturally occurring chromium. And we have looked at that. We're not very convinced that we see that. Right now, we're still assuming that everything we see in these plumes is contaminant chromium. To answer your second question, I'll start out by saying I always have a little tiny nightmare every time I come to present here because of your questions, anticipating your questions. <laughs> um, but, um, because you always nail me on the geochemistry stuff. But um, we actually do collect ORP um, in the field, and all the ORP values, even within the center of the plume, from field measurements, which we think are the most accurate way to do it, because the minute you pull these things out of the field, they're subject for changes along um, the pathway to the laboratory, all within or within normal groundwater um, ranges. pHs are, are normal, um, ORP looks just right. And so we're not seeing anything that shows evidence of strong perturbations, oxidation reduction potential. So we're not seeing any evidence of, of real perturbations in the basic chemistry that is hosting, the, the basic chemistry of the groundwater that's hosting these contaminants. Well, it's just like uh, having the wetlands. Uh, there's eutrophication going on. That's right. And that eutrophication is almost always reducing. Right. So it's going to reduce chromium-6 to chromium-3 very effectively. And you saw that, 15,000 kilograms yeah. over there as well. I should point out, 
think back again about that 58,000 kilogram number I used for the, the mean of the total amount released. The plume in the regional aquifer comprised by that shaded area there might be about 1,000 kilograms. So it tells us one of two things. Either a whole lot of it got there and is dispersed away and is immeasurable now because it's so diluted in the groundwater, or there are reservoirs of it where it's been held up along the way and what we see in the regional aquifer is actually a small fraction and may never become a whole lot bigger than that. There's a real good possibility that we're not looking at an advancing plume but relatively a, a relatively stable plume. It's one of the big questions that are play is how much chromium is still sort of in the pipe, if you will, on the way to the groundwater. One more question and then we're going to have to break for dinner. Okay, the end point to this excellent uh, presentation is what can this board recommend as to ameliorate the problem that you so expertly uh, laid out for us? Um, start by stopping Bob from asking me questions. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I think that uh, my experience with, um, you know, I don't feel like it's my place to tell you what's coming. My experience with you guys uh, can certainly um, suggest that, but my experience has been is that um, with the kind of information presented here and, and the way you guys um, delve into the reports, um, I found your, um, your completely independent recommendations to be pretty much on mark. And, you know what? Sometimes we, we ran, back in 2008, we ran two um, sort of community workshops, if you will. And you guys were sort of the, the centerpiece of it. We used the CAB as a forum to try to bring in community input on conceptual models back in 2007, 2008 timeframe on what we were thinking at that time. And we actually found it profound, actually, the kind of information and insights that, as you put it, babes in the woods brought sometimes the simplest questions. Um, cause us to go back and think about something differently. Either we're not explaining it right, or we haven't thought about something because we're so close to it, we didn't see the forest for the trees. So, frankly, I, I don't think there's anything you could do beyond what you're already doing, which is staying engaged, um, asking tough questions, and, um, and, 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 and obviously you'll have an opportunity to uh, provide input, um, very important input when we get into the alternatives analysis through the, through the CME. I am aware, I think it was a formal recommendation out of the CAB, maybe not very long ago, maybe it was two years ago, a year ago, to actually stabilize the wetland. So I can't say that that recommendation by itself is what drove it, but certainly it helped serve up a smart action in the field. Okay, so before we break, I need to get an idea as to how many people are coming back. Uh, we have a recommendation on the floor that we need to vote on. And so if I can just get an idea, um, Show of hands, who's going to be here?